is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, let us know, uh, James, when you're ready. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah you sound good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's always that like moment of apprehension. It's like, what's going on? Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Richard Devine and I are doing the uh, the purple background color, which is man, I got my lights purple too. Oh, we're good. live. We're, okay. How's everyone doing, man? Good. Everyone, good. Thank Excellent. you so much for for joining everyone, and thank you so much everyone at home for watching. I'm joined here by a bunch of my good friends who are also just prolific film composers and sound designers, and I just like have so many questions and like so many things that I want to kind of pick your brains about today, especially in a time where everything is so unstable and uncertain and how the film industry and the sound design industry is kind of like, you know, adjusting to match that. Um, so I'm really excited to talk with you, uh, with you guys about everything. Um, I guess I'll start by introducing, well, Matt, Matt, you want to introduce yourself first? Sure. Well, hey, I'm Matt. Um, yeah, it's good to see all of you guys. I mean, I'm a big fan of Robert, Richard. I was just using your splice pack yesterday, Richard. So <laughs> that's so awesome. Cool stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's been a cool time. I mean, uh, so I'm a composer, sound designer. Um, recently I started a podcast called Composer Talk, which has been a lot of fun where I interview composers about their backstory more so than their most recent project because that's what it tends to focus on. And yeah, um, yeah it's been really great. So far I just uh, interviewed uh, my friend Ryan Elder who does the music for Rick and Morty. Um, a friend named Mandy Hoffman, who does some amazing scoring shows, um, and then Teddy Shapiro last week, which was amazing. Um, and yeah, there's some other cool guests coming up soon, so super excited about that. Nice. Uh, Peter. Okay, so I, I guess you could say musical sound design in the context of film and TV um, is a lot of what I end up doing for a couple of different composers, and as a sort of separate kind of parallel thing, uh, spent many years, like decades actually, working with a guy called John Hassel, who's a oh. really uh, uh, fascinating musician, trumpet player, uh, composer. And so, um, you know, I came out here, I was originally from New York and I came out here, gotta be 18 years ago to Los Angeles and started working with, uh, working in film and TV with uh, Charlie Clauser, who I think Patrick and Ray mm -hmm. are friends with. Um, on shows back then, like Las Vegas, Numbers, things like that, and a bunch of the Saw, the Saw movies ever since the beginning of that. There's actually just, there's another one happening that we, that it's the most recent thing I did with Charlie was the, the reboot of the whole Saw thing. But could, again, entirely separately, the, the John Hassel stuff was, was a really big thing for me because I, someone that I always admired since I was a teenager and ended up co-producing three records and touring for a really long time, um, many, many years. And so that's kind of like a, the capsule soundbite version. Nice. Um, Robert. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, guys. So I'm um, Robert Dozik. I'm sound designer. And I started my career a long time ago when I come to America. And I just don't want to work anymore in the grocery store. <laughs> so I started playing with sounds. Yeah, the, guys, that's the, that's the story. You know, like I come, I wasn't speaking English. So I say, I want to do something with my life. So I'm starting making sounds. And one day I discovered lots of you guys. And one of the big icon who I discovered, there was actually Richard, you know, who I have a pleasure to meet him. And we talk a lot of times on the name show. And one day say like, I want to be like him. <laughs> you know, what I, mean? so I was like watching his steps and try to come with my sons. And that's basically, and let me right now doing sons for so many movie trailers, pretty much any blockbuster Marvel movies, anything was come. That's a piece of me when I'm doing the sons. And I designs come into my, doing my videos and show to people online and give them some inspiration, teaching them how easy it is to turn everyday objects and transform them to big cinematic sounds. And so far it's working. So this is where I am right now, you know? I'm joining you guys as like a lead. So I feel very privileged and honored, you know, to be next to all of you guys. So that's, that's me. <laughs> awesome, man. Um, Evan. Hey, I'm uh, Evan Hodges. I'm a film composer. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. I've uh, been scoring for film for about five or six years now. I uh, was a professional musician, still am, um, but kind of made the jump over, like I said back then. Um, I got really into to, uh, electronic music in my like late high school years. I got into Bjork and Aphex. Uh, so I acquired like, I grew up in a classical, like 
classically trained home. My dad was a musician and built horns. So I like have like a lot of a uh, traditional kind of classical arrangements in my compositions. But then obviously I have like Aphex and Bjork kind of inspirations as well. So it's kind of a marriage of, of the two. So, yeah. Cool, man. Uh, Jacob. Hey, um, I'm Jacob Shea and I'm a composer in Los Angeles. I started uh, my journey in the film sphere uh, by assisting a bunch of guys around town. And I, I kind of wound up in 2006 uh, as, as an assistant for Hans Zimmer. And uh, he kind of, uh, among many other things, taught me to kind of look at um, a mix and a blend of instruments as, as kind of, you, you know, the, the modern orchestra contains all sound and, and to just kind of pick um, what, whatever is, is most emotive or, or most inspiring and, and kind of don't question where this, the sound source is coming from. Uh, and so I, I am, because of him, kind of really into electronic music and I'm a fan of Mr. Divine's. Uh, <laughs> <for sure. laughs> yeah, man. And so I, I've been uh, fortunate to to acquire, you know, some electronic instruments, and and I just greatly enjoy exploring sound. Nice. Uh, yeah, I will say I will say Richard Divine's Instagram is amazing. <laughs> like the most like whenever I'm like, man, like I don't have anything to do. It's like I like look, I'm like shit. Like Richard's like on it, man. I gotta like write something right now. <laughs> <laughs> You, you make this old boring dad feel uh, <laughs> I, so I feel like the most uncool person these days. It's so funny. Like <laughs> I'm here playing in the, like the Creek in the yard with my two kids, you know, like and under quarantine and stuff. And we're like, you know, our biggest thing lately is uh, I get these barred owls that live in our backyard. There's like four or five of them. And I'm using this app by Cornell University that has all these different calls where you can like call a, f a male or a female or <laughs> a couple of them fight and think that there's other males and females in the area. So I've been using this app to call these different, all these different species of birds into our yard. And my kids are like, whoa, that's what a red hawk looks like. And a <laughs> you're like a disney oh, princess man. Yeah, yeah it is <laughs> this app is really awesome yeah you can call any species of bird and, and like they'll show up <laughs> if you have a loud enough speaker that can project the sound so it's just really uh, it's been a lot of fun but yeah <laughs> conducting aviary psyops <laughs> <laughs> cruel exactly. man it's cruel <laughs> um craig why don't you uh, introduce yourself Hi, I'm Craig Wedren. I'm a composer for film and TV, and I write songs, and I sing. I do a lot of music, a lot of music. That's <laughs> Oh, but, but Peter, I, I just, I had to say, um, uh, the, the album Surgeon of the Night Sky restores dead things with the power of sound. I wasn't involved in that, but go on. <laughs> I know, I know. It's you probably were barely born. By no, John no, no. Hassel. Just, yeah. By That's John Hassel record. was a huge inspiration for me and a huge influence on my um, on my scores, actually, or just on my sort of scoring technique. And, and when I was in college, my friend Rick and I had a chance to see him perform solo at the World Trade Center. Was that the was that the 89 concert or later than that? It was probably 89 and I Eno saw that was show. Mixing, I was Eno there. was mixing it live. Yeah, that was oh, yeah, actually that was the first day I met John funnily enough. Yeah, that was um that was the actually the day our, our friendship started funnily. It's a weird story but we, uh, Ray actually Susan introduced me to John. Anyway. Um yeah, that, yeah, that, that was that, that was extraordinary. The Surgeon I mean, of the Night Sky. That's, like, that record like is entirely one, it's live, con it's all live concerts. It's all just manipulated performances. Like, like you know, just uh, some, it's in some cases that's stereo elements, you know, stereo mixes. So it's interesting. Yeah, it was, it anyway, was, it, sorry was to you. it was like, I mean, it was truly ambient in that it was the World Financial Center, I guess, not the World Trade Center. Yeah. Um, during lunch hour. So there's all the, all these like besuited New Yorkers walking around being like, what the fuck? 
<laughs> like sort of swirling <laughs> horns kind of. I think that it's, it's, that room had about a 10 second reverb time, yeah. an actual reverb time. Yeah. And there was also a, one part of it where you could go and it had um, a place where the echoes focused. I don't know if you ever had a chance to be in that room. Uh, I was actually in that room when they were installing the sound system and it was an incredible room. It, I think it all got destroyed. I don't know if they rebuilt it or not. It's yeah, it got really, uh, the glass got trashed during 9-11, but I think they did, I think they restored it as, as, I, as I recall, I think they did. Oh, that's good. It is weird though, like a, the- A strange room. It, it literally, Ray's not exaggerating. It's like a 10 second reverb in there. So like anything to do with groove or basses or anything is just like ridiculous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, it, they should, it, it should have just been John playing by himself. But anyway, I well, no, even even at that age, my friend and I we were like, I don't know what Eno is doing, but it sounds like an impossible gig. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, between it everybody was. talking and and munching and and not paying attention and the ten second reverb. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Richard, do you mind introducing yourself? <laughs> uh, sure. Uh... Yeah, I guess um, for those of you that don't know, I'm, my name is Richard Devine. Uh, I'm an electronic producer, sound designer. Um, yeah, my career started many, many, many years ago from reaching back to high school, playing with modular synthesizers, and then uh, getting into sound design, I guess, in, I want to say, like, 1999, 98, kind of by accident. It wasn't ever something I was... Uh, ever intended to do it just kind of fell into my lap and I didn't even know that sound design was like a term or there was even a job that you could take as a sound designer I was just making really weird fucked up electronic music and um, that took interest with different labels and I still work with electronic labels putting on electronic music but um, I think I think it was Native Instruments Native Instruments was the first company that reached out to me in 1999 uh, about doing some sound design work for them and um, and then I worked on, I've actually worked on almost every single product that they've released, uh, doing patches or samples or whatever you, uh, whatever kind of content. And then from there, I guess, um, it was just a snowball effect. Everyone started knocking at my door and was like, Hey, who was the guy who made all these weird sounds in absinthe? And, uh, <laughs> we'd like to get in contact with him and, that was you cool. know, yeah, it was me. Getting contact it's, with. Him. I didn't. I didn't realize that Native Instruments would get so big. When I first met them, they were a very small company, five six people. It was you know, um, Daniel Haver, who's the CEO now, Mata, who's the CTO now, and uh, just a few people at the office when I visited in Berlin when I was playing a show there. And I that first revolution when everything went, you know, virtual instruments when they released Pro Fifty Three and the Hammond B Three, everyone was like, "Whoa, the computer is actually." going to be a very serious instrument for us you know it's right. people started to really take it seriously then as far um, as it just you know just being like pro tools and being like a two-track recorder now you could do advanced synthesis and you know emulate these instruments that you know would be virtually impossible in any other form uh, format so that uh that took me by surprise so when all their software started getting installed in movie studios, gaming studios all over the world. I started getting calls from, you know, everybody. And uh, I didn't, like I said, it was completely by accident. So I kind of didn't know what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I do so many things. It's crazy. I do sound for video games, film, virtual reality, uh, to uh, now I'm getting into designing sounds for electric cars. Now I'm working with multiple different companies, um, which also was totally by accident. That wasn't anything that I was like, hey, I want to be that guy. No, there was just nobody else that was doing it. And they're like, hey, have you ever done this? I'm like, nope. And they're like, okay, we're going to see, we're going to screw up together then. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's been a wild ride. You know, I've, I've, you know, people ask me all the time and, you know, for me, sound, it keeps changing the, the uh, landscape of what I've been doing. Is It's not just film and TV spots. I was working the commercial, uh, doing TV commercials for about 24 years, working with different advertising agency houses. And I did film trailers and uh, a couple of movie scores and stuff. But then uh, once I started working with a lot of the companies in Silicon Valley, like Apple and Google, uh, using user interaction sound for like products and apps and 
crazy things like Google Earth virtual reality. And uh, it started to get really wild. And now I'm, I'm in this whole different thing where I'm applying sound in areas where I was like, wow, I didn't, it, as the technologies change, you're seeing you know, the, uh, the application for sound design go into new areas that I never even dreamed would happen. So it's, for me, it's really exciting to see this new technology emerging. And then, you know, I'm getting calls from these companies that one of, like just the other day, I got a call from a company that designs AI, uh, AI driven, they're like life size Formula One race cars, mm -hmm. electric race cars, but they're not driven by humans. They're all AI algorithm driven race cars so you get in you have your car on the track and someone else has against it but whose algorithm is better at driving these electric robot race cars and <laughs> so they've hired me to design these sounds for these robot race cars and i, I have no idea what they're going to sound like or you know it's like super crazy stuff that if you would ask me like five years ago i would have been like no way are you kidding me i'm going to design ai robot race car sounds that <laughs> or life sounds like crazy right now so it probably sounded crazier back then <laughs> it's yeah totally even now it sounds crazy yeah it's just some <laughs> of the stuff that shows up on my plate is just beyond anything i would have ever imagined working on so but yeah it's too i mean it's so much stuff going on it's too much even to you know in one pair one or two paragraphs but yeah I, yeah, yeah. I pretty much do everything i guess that has to deal with weird sound implemented in some sort of environment or <laughs> that's the best way i can sum it up at this point <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> um and john you want to introduce yourself no oh, i think your audio is muted yeah I, I i was muting uh sorry yeah i'm john natchez um i'm a musician and composer i'm based in los angeles although that's a fairly recent thing it's a couple of years ago three years ago now uh, but my background is as a performer, I guess. Um, John, I'm a horn player originally, and John Hassel, it's appropriate, I guess, in an eventide video that we're, this has become a John Hassel appreciation uh, show. But like John Hassel's huge, huge, huge influence on, on me. I, 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 was a horn, I, I was a horn player, but like pretty early on was just like not the kind of horn player who was interested in taking like 10 minute funk solos or whatever. And like, just was like kind of searching for different ways of thinking about music that felt uh, right to me. And around the same time as I found John Hassel, I uh, was lucky enough, I was at college and happened to take this weird, amazing uh, year long course with a, a composer and, and musician named Kurt Stallman. And uh, it was uh, a year with an original surge modular synth. The, the title of the course was electronic music, but it really was that sort of conceptual approach to electronic music of like thinking, rethinking music as sound and, and sort of what Jacob I think was saying of like exploring sound and texture and timbre. And that kind of unlocked all the doors for me. And ever since then um, I spent, uh, most of my adult life as a performer in various bands, um, playing horns and other stuff through various pedals or using various means of uh, exploring textures and timbres and things like that. Um, I still do play in one band. I'm a member of a band called The War on Drugs and we still do stuff and when, whenever live music happens again. Uh, but a few years ago, um, Thanks to the encouragement of friends in particular, coincidentally, Craig Wedren, who's up in my thing, like who I've, I've known Craig since New York, like a frightening, like we, we both lived in New York a frighteningly long time ago. And I'd always recorded with him. I'd always loved his film scoring work. And he's like, you should try film scoring. I think you'd really like it. And I think with your sort of interests and abilities, you could, you'd have fun with it. And that proved very prescient and true. And so like about five-ish years ago, I, I started diving into film scoring and really, really, really love it. And that's most of my focus these days. Um, yeah, and it's just uh, sort of, again, dovetailing on what Jacob said, just I sort of love spending my time and my mental energy thinking about music as texture and tone and timbre and uh, how to explore those that sort of axis of music as well as harmony and 
melody and, and rhythm and, and those kinds of things. I think, I think it's important to interject here that John and I um, met because we were in a burlesque troupe together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A political, you know, political undies. It was like political. Yeah, burlesque. yeah, it was weird, sort of punk rock, New York. It, it was back during a time when we thought the country was as reactionary as it could possibly <laughs> ever get <laughs> in like 2002 right. and something needed to be done. Oh my God, <laughs> memories. I guess um, we should start a political burlesque troop again. At yeah, that's, that's the answer to all <laughs> our problems. Right. We got Obama after that. <laughs> yeah, so. it worked before. We got nine people here. <laughs> that's enough for a burlesque troop. Hell yeah, man. Do it. <laughs> They're going to love us. Below the waist. <laughs> um, so my first question is like, I, so Richard, I was listening to one of your um, workshops earlier. And like at the beginning of the thing, someone asked you kind of like what your superhero origin story was. And I remember you said you bought your first synth, the ARP uh, 2600 um, at 17 when you were in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that you just spent most of your time in your parents' garage dropping acid and sound designing. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Yeah, I, uh, my parents had this two, two car garage. It was like, but it had super tall ceilings. So it would echo the reverberation in that room was amazing. Just the natural acoustics of that had a concrete floor. So I used to take the, the ARP in there and oh, I did this. I probably spent 10,000 hours in there on that instrument. Cause when I got the ARP, it was such a groundbreaking synth for me at that age too, when you're like 16, 17, you know, um, I remember just reading, I think it was the, um, it was a book that was released by Keyboard Magazine. Oh God, what was it? It was the Atlanta, synth uh, not the, no, the, um, the, the synthesizer handbook, I think. Oh, of you mean like uh, Jim Craig Anderton? Book? Craig, Craig Anderton, I think. Yeah, it had like a, the yeah. EMS synthy on the front cover and it was a pretty thick book that had, you know, all these iconic synthesizers from different time periods and where they were used and the significance of them. And I remember reading a little caption about Ben Burt making the sounds of R2-D2 with the, with the ARP 2600. And I was like, oh man, I'm a huge Ben Burt fan. He's like one of my all time heroes. Uh, if he, if he uses this synth, I have to find, I have to be, have to get this synth somehow. So uh, that began my journey into looking for that synth. And I didn't realize even, I didn't even know even at the time what that synth really did. I just knew that if Ben used it and you could make robotic, these robotic sounds with it, these alien robotic sounds, I was like, I have to figure out and understand how that works. And that's why I even looked for the ARP. Uh, and then when I actually found one, uh, I got it for fairly cheap and then I used it. I mean, I, that's, I still have my ARP uh, sitting over here and, um, I, you know, I tell people all the time that it was such a great instrument to get at such a young age to teach you about the basic fundamentals of synthesis and sound shaping, you know, what, you know, um, without even using a single patch cable, the, the fact that you could just bring up different combinations of faders to get and to understand really basic concepts like cross modulation of oscillators, what's the volt voltage control amplifier do, you know, what does the, you know, VCF do, do or, um, you know, a lag processor or a ring modulator. These, these concepts uh, to me that were foreign at the time, I, you know, I kind of just stumbled upon these things. I was like, oh, that's how he was getting this or this type of sound, you know? And um, so it was, for me, it was kind of like the first building block. From that point, I started to buy other, I, I, I had, the bug was in me at that point. I was like, I need to find other synthesizers that allow you to patch have, or patching flexibility. So I bought like the Electrocopy ML 101 after that. Uh, I got an ARP 2500 system, uh, bought it from a university. At that time, a lot of universities were getting rid of this stuff. They didn't care about analog. The golden age. The golden age, yeah. I came in at a really good time during the early 90s. I was really hungry for this stuff. And at that time, people just wanted digital workstations, realistic sounding stuff. All the analog stuff was selling for Behringer prices at pawn shops. <laughs> um, you know, I'd go in and buy 303s and 808s and these things that, you uh, know, for $4,000 now for a couple hundred bucks. I bought three 303s, one new in the box for 150 bucks. My ARP 2600, I paid 250 for. 
I bought an Oberheim expander for like, oh, wow. I think it was 150 bucks at a Salvation Army. Whoa. It was on the You're... floor sitting next to a bunch of golf clubs. When I walked in, I go, no way. Are you kidding? That's a good day. <laughs> yeah, I walked in and I was like, this is how, when, when is this going to happen again? Probably never. And it never did. But I mean, just crazy stuff like that. I was Jupiter sixes, Jupiter eights. You think of all these. Uh, I had a CS80, all the big iconic, like, um, you know, monster poly analog sense uh, from that time period. I was able to just get my hands on so much stuff. And it was great because it was cheap. And number two, I was, it was a great way to learn about synthesizers um, and get a basic funnel understanding of, you know, how to, how to work with these, how to make music with them. Uh, and I was also building... I didn't realize at the time, but I would record two hour DAT tapes. But I know people are probably like, what the heck is a DAT tape? But I used to record to DAT tapes here. Um, and I would just hook up all these synths and record them, even though I knew some of them weren't supposed to be to work together or that, like some of the Korg stuff, like my Monopoly and some of the others, like my MS-20s, MS-10s, like um, required dinner, different interfacing to to work with each other, even some of the sense you were compatible to controlling. So, I, But I would still hook them up anyway. There was no wrong or right way. It was just kind of me learning how each one of these synths had its own characteristics and personalities and traits. And um, so I would record hours and hours of stuff with, with these synths. And then after that, I got an EMS Synthi, uh, an AKS. And uh, I had the, 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 uh, yeah, the AKS with the keyboard, and then I got the DK1 Crickle, Cricklewood keyboard, which was a, an extended keyboard um, that you could hook into that. And I'd be portable <laughs> and small. You could, you know, just grab a pair of headphones and um, work with it anywhere. It was like just the whole idea of having this like portable analog synthesizer. I didn't even need patch cables. It was really easy to recall uh, patch notes because you had these little resistor pins that had different colors and um, you would just patch on this, you know, XY matrix. Um, and it was just that machine. I, you know, I really like lived with that machine, you know, for many, many, many years learning things. And, um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I don't even know. That was like a really amazing time for me. Um, yeah. and yeah, just, yeah. Mix of psychedelics, just wanting to learn <laughs> and playing with synths. That was pretty much it. You know, it was my, I opened the third ear just to, <laughs> <laughs> To make sure that I was absorbing everything that needed to be there. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a great time. It's, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't change that experience for any, anything. You know, I really, I wouldn't be here today hadn't been for that. So right. uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> I don't know yeah. everybody's upbringing, that, but that was mine. Um, well, that's like a good kind of like segue in a sense of like, sound design and film composing I, I i mean i i don't have a ton of experience but it feels like it's very against the grain in terms of like commercial music or traditional music senses so like this is a question for really everyone and whoever wants to answer like what was your really like your inspiration or your hero when it comes to sound design and like your motivation to like i gotta keep going with this because this is the shit even though i know that this isn't like commercial music when I was in New York, I interned in high school for a guy named Tyreek Washington, who was a composer uh, just for TV. And I remember I didn't know anything about really like producing music, uh, especially with computers at the time. I just played in bands in New York. But there was one day that we went out with field recorders and he said, okay, Matt, just sit here and just record sound and try to listen to the rhythms of New York. And I just thought it was so stupid. <laughs> um, and then... Yeah, after a certain while of just sitting out there, you hear like a random rhythm of just like a loose wheel on like a, a bus going by, next, like hitting a weird rhythm of someone walking or running and all these things kind of come together. And I thought like, huh, that's so interesting. Um, and years later, I, I, well, one of my friends and sound design uh, heroes, Andrew Huang, he just makes a lot of music out of um, found sounds. like. I think I discovered his stuff when he made a video out of um, an apple and he just like slapped the apple, he blew into the apple, made it into like a whistle. And yeah, I think that type of stuff's so interesting. And then when it comes to story with um, film, trying to figure out what types of sounds you can use that evoke certain emotions is very helpful. Um, even those rhythms too in New York, thinking about if someone's anxious on screen, maybe having the tempo speed up over time or create that illusion. 
Um, maybe you can do that with just like a multi-tap delay going left to right and just like creating some anxiety that way. Maybe you can have the delay go from left to right as opposed to just bouncing between the two. Um, that was kind of my start with it. Nice. Dude, I remember um, your last day at Eventide as an intern and we brought you to Building 2, which is Building 2 at Eventide um, is kind it's of haunted. like this horror, like storage, that, dude, full of like gear that you've never even heard of before. There's like, <laughs> like the first computer ever was there. <laughs> like, Commodore <laughs> Pet. <laughs> Cassette Lewis drive. Abraham Lincoln lives there too. <laughs> <laughs> there are alien ghosts there too, for sure. It, to, definitely an alien ghost in there. There's like a Faraday cage where it's just like it, it's it's a really weird place, and that's where we built the studio now. Um, but we we took Matt there his last day, and we were just like, "Yo, Matt, can you grab something from the back hallway?" Uh, and then we would just sneak around and bang on stuff, and like we're gonna scare the shit out of this kid. It worked. <laughs> Scooby Doo. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyone else kind of like want to chime in and like, what's your big inspiration for getting into sound design and film scoring? I, uh, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, for me, it was a, a dual obsession, wh which continues to this day, with um, music and movies in parallel. And I think the point at which I got beyond like Kiss or the Sex Pistols and was listening more to ambient music and contemporary classical music and um, free jazz. This would have been around college. Um, you know, it was, it was probably a moment where it connected with me, kind of like the slightly more grown up version of when I connected that Kiss was just a bunch of geeky Jewish boys. <laughs> <laughs> not like actual superhero monsters and that I could therefore do that too was when I started singing in bands. Um, when I started composing for student films and um, you know black box theater pieces in college was around when I just realized that music in certain ways was freer um, in film, um, that the, the, the dividing line between song, sound design, and score really was not something that I ever um, uh, subscribed to and something I could fully explore like in this realm while also getting to basically make movies, help make movies. Yeah, I was gonna say for me, um... I grew up on Star Wars as a kid on VHS. Uh, for people that are listening that are young, VHS was this little tape that you'd put <laughs> in the thing. <laughs> That's right, in the thing. And there was a tracking button that didn't do anything, but it's there to make you feel like it's doing something. Uh, so I grew up, yeah, I grew up on Star Wars. Um, so, like, motific development was like hammered in my head as an early age because I was just infatuated with John Williams. And the other composer that's huge on my list is Koji Kondo, who is the composer for Zelda. Um, those two kind of, you know, like I was a nerdy kid, I watched Star Wars, and I went to comic book shops and read comics, comic books, and I played Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64. And so like, all about like the immersive experience of score and music in, in video games and in, in film, it's just like this amazing thing. And it's kind of funny, it's come full circle. My daughter started playing in 64, uh, Ocarina of Time. And I hey. taught them a couple of the themes from the from the Koji Kondo well, soundtrack. Da, 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 Lost da, Woods, da, that's right. Classic, See? classic. <laughs> Lydian, Lydian, one, three, one, three, sharp, four. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I mean, it's, for me, it's all about like world building and and like telling a story. And it doesn't matter, It's it doesn't matter if it's on film or if it's, you know, a uh, video game or a commercial or anything like that, right? It's, it's, we're, we're storytellers, so, yeah. So, guys, I tell you, I, I, I start my inspiration like when I come to America and I listen first time radio. And there was like Z100 in New York and I listened like, what was the sounds going between the songs, whatever they play? And I have no idea. It's like how the guys clapping at the same time, all drums comes like, how they're doing? So I, I get into this sound design and I met guy in the local radio stations and 
he showed me how he was doing all these commercials and the special promos and everything, the effects what he's doing. So he was giving me challenge to doing this stuff. And I remember at this time, I just learned, I was having Cakewalk, that was in 1992, I think so. And I was having Sandforge. And I was starting playing with the Sands and the Sandforge and, and I was starting to go, I get myself like little, the Sony dot recorder, I think so that was TD7, like the little handle dot recorder. And I was starting recording sounds with this thing. And this is where starting all the journey because making the, the sounds for the radio was like, it's like for me, that was like a creating like a virtual theater of the mind, like trying to make people fool them enough so they're gonna really believe that they're, they're not distract, but make them feel like they actually, if there was commercial for like movie or something, make them feel like they actually and, and the place of the action. So I was going actually recording really organic sounds outside, going outside the home train station, train, buses, everything, because, you know, like, and radio, there's always contests of people want to win money, something, trip vacations. So I was travel recording. And I think, so this is how I get the inspiration from simple by listen radio. And from doing this thing, I get lucky enough, I learn so much and I transform myself to starting, starting doing stuff for videos, you know what I mean? Starting doing for TVs and, and now for the trailers because it's stay my job to basically almost like take your imagination and fool you and creating sounds, what's gonna make you believe that's the sound, but it's actually really not. You know, like just example, like somebody punch you in the face. Like we all guys, we all eventually burn sometimes in the fight. And you know, when you punch somebody, the punch never sound like this thing. It's, but you got to make the sounds bigger, accelerate. So this is how I learned from the radio because you have short time to get the sound and make people believe this thing. Like, so this is how I get, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know any of the big name sound designers. I know Star Wars, I know Star Trek, I know so many other movies, but you have to remember like when I come to America, like I wasn't speaking <clears throat> English and I was into, I learned to speak English from the closed caption. And today people say to me, because I learn from close ups, I speak like a Yoda and the reverse sometimes. <laughs> I have no grammar, so I, I speak completely different. So this is how I learn, you know? So I don't know what's Tim Burton. I don't know who was Richard Devine at this time. I, I don't know any of these guys. I just, my ears was open and learning and this is how I become. Th there was my inspiration basically that the sounds were what surrounding me and this is where they get me today. So th this is how I get into this stuff. Wow. That's awesome. I, I wanted to say that um, when I was in college, actually, I, before I even got into the film kind of music side of things, I, I took an electronic music class from this guy, Curtis Rhodes at UC Santa Barbara. And he's kind of an amazing uh, electronic artist and, and just a, a, a really brilliant man. And he... Uh, he showed us one day in class this this album that Paul Lansky had done, who's a composer out of Princeton, and um, it was uh, Tables Clear. It was it was he had programmed his kids playing pots and pans in uh, his kitchen, and then went to a IBM mainframe or some sort of really old computer, and and painstakingly created these textures that. Um, when I first heard it, I I was just obsessed. I thought I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. And it was the first time I had really thought, okay, you can use the computer as like a musical instrument and you just take all these different things and, and you use the computer to perform what's kind of in your head. And uh, then fast forward a couple of years, I, I saw Punch Trunk Love, uh, which was, yeah. you know, uh, scored by the amazing John Bryan. And, he was kind of using similar sort of like all the, the percussion textures and timbres in that it really felt um, like it, it didn't have any basis in, in <laughs> like the, it, it wasn't a musical instrument. It was this other thing. And, and you were just on the ride and you could allow your imagination to be as free as the music was being. Mm -hmm. And uh uh, I'd say those two moments really set me off in a direction. That's really cool, man. Kurt, Curtis is a big hero of mine. Uh, He's amazing. Yeah, he uh, he messaged me randomly. I uh, you know I bought all his books. Uh, oh, yeah. 
Yeah, the computer music tutorial and music signal processing. I mean, foundations in computer music, MIT Press Edition. Like, I had been, I'd studied his stuff since OS 9, OS 9.2, the old school Mac days when I actually was running. Collider and cloud generator. Yep, cloud generator. I have his, I actually have his super collider patch oh, when i went geez. to visit he invited me to come out to uc uh santa barbara when he was teaching uh and so i played a, a performance with curtis on this eight channel system that they had wow. there and um yeah i was just blown away even to get an email he was like hey i'm what i'd be interested to know if you be if it'll be okay to include you in my new book and i nearly like fell out of my chair <laughs> like what what have i done that would make it in a curtis rhodes book you know and he it was some it was a chapter on sequencing alternative approaches to sequencing and uh so there was some diagrams about how i was using uh i can't remember what it was like two sequencers one sequencer to sequence another sequencer and it was just these interesting different approaches to you know coming up with different sounds and um yeah meaning curtis was like one of the top gods for me, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, he, 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 yeah, I credit him with like really setting me off in that. I, he, he's just a, a, an amazing, he, amazing he, um, oh, electronic. Perception of time, what Curtis's perception of time is so interesting, you know, I mean, taking say like when he first showed me his super collider, that super collider patch where you can you take like six seconds of just like tree branches cracking and you could, he could create an entire seven, 10 minute composition of extremely detail. We're talking like you're hearing every grain has its own reverb density trail, like intricate fractals of sound off just six seconds of sound, you know, like creating this, it just, I remember just always being like, wow, there's, this is somebody who really, really thinks radically different about sound on a, like on a microscopic scale, you know, there's just so much that you can do. Um, and yeah, he really, really was, yeah, a, a one, like a big pioneer for me. I know, like I, I've been hugely influenced by his, uh, his teachings and his works and his approaches to uh, dealing with sound and I love his concepts about time and you know what time really is when it comes to music working in these like super <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it I mean you know you could say he's like the one of the grandfathers of granular synthesis because um, I remember when I had Pulsar running on my Mac you know I had very I had very you know that's this is probably 90 late 90s early 2000s probably around that time and that sounds I, like I remember there was maybe two or three applications that dealt with granular synthesis. I had a couple on the Windows platform. I was using Composer's Desktop Project, Tre Trevor Wishart, and uh, they had they had their granular applications as well. It was very very crude instruments that the, or it, environments that could do that. So if you could do it in Max, I was doing some Max had some Max MSP patches. I was running generator pre reactor stuff, but really Curtis was one of the first that was, you know killing it in that area and i mean killing it hard uh, if you if you ask me um for those of you that don't know his work you should check out like point line cloud he released in two, uh, 2005 on asphodel records they uh released one of my albums from 2003 but um that record is absolutely incredible half-life um you know is, is another is another great one some of his earlier works from the late 90s it's just some if you guys are looking for stuff that's a little bit out of the box, but uh, extremely awesome and inspiring. He does, does some really cool work. I, I did not expect to hear Curtis's name today. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> He's the hero for sure. That's so cool. Super cool. Awesome. <laughs> Pat, I should probably interject something. It might be interesting to, to sort of address your original thing, if I may, um, yeah. about just like, because the way I ended up in the whole film universe or TV universe is completely almost kind of an accident and not, you know, necessarily a, a normal path, whatever that is. Um, and it's like, I guess the, the, the simplest way to encapsulate it is like back in the late eighties, early nineties, I was deeply into the synthesizer universe I had the whole rig with some of the stuff that Richard was mentioning. Cause again, it was that time when you could get 
what are now $30,000 synths for 10 bucks at Goodwill. So I had a Oberheim 8 voice, like the original 8 SEMs from Unique in New York with no keyboard that had been repackaged into a separate frame with MIDI in, like basically a, just a giant module someone had made out of it. And, uh, you know, OBX and Provid VS and the Voyetra and all that stuff, that was the rig. And, you know, um, and for years and years, that's what I did everything with in, in New York, you know, was doing commercials and whatever sessions I could find and the occasional record work. And that was, you know, the, I was deeply into the programming aesthetic that kind of came from uh, sort of, it's a bizarre set of influences like, you know, Joe Zawinul in the seventies and, you know, Japan in the early eighties. Like that's, that was kind of the, the foundation of what I thought was interesting in, on, in the synthesizer world. And then at a certain point, you know, this, my primary thing is being a bass player though, specifically, you know, bass playing in the traditional sense, but also very much processing, you know, ever since I was a teenager, I was just taking, you know, chaining pedals together and always, always about getting away from the normal sound of the instrument as much as possible and trying to make it be something totally other. That was just kind of always there somehow. And so this whole time with synthesizers, I was trying to find, you know, as much other worldly stuff as I could. And I, I liked the sounds I was making, but I didn't think I did. I didn't think I did the best music in that universe. It just, there was some kind of block where it, something about working with synthesizers was not like my direct path. It wasn't the best path. So I sort of got rid of everything and really focused only on sampling and, and processing as the, as the only two things for anything that I was ever gonna do. And that led, it kind of forced me to find a language that was my own sort of weird methodology of like getting to stuff that was personal, like super kind of weirdly personal stuff that you know, it was the, the most direct kind of, you know, when you're trying to evoke something that's like from your hallucinations or your dreams or whatever. And so that was my path. And so I've spent decades just figuring out that's where the eventide thing started was, you know, for me was the, with the 4,000. And I was on tour at the time. This is back in, in this is like 20, 26 years ago, but I, you know, Ray, Ray knew me from, from that. It was the, the seal, the seal days, but that was, it was all, I, in that situation, I had latitude to do processing and stuff. And I just kept going with what I was doing. So I finally got out to, I was working with John Hassel later on in the, in like, I met him in 1990 and we started doing stuff and I got deeply into sample manipulation as like a pure methodology. And I said to him at one point, you know, I was working on a record of stuff of music done only with process based samples, no other sound sources, meaning that, that, that had the bass had to be turned into everything. Anytime you heard like any drums, any textures, any melodic instruments, it was all basses that have been insanely worked into a microscopic absurdity levels to get to this kind of place. And I, I, I called John one day and I said, you know, might be something cool if I took some of your, you know, your back catalog and processed it to create new element, new pieces, not remixes, but new music. And so he said, sure, you make a demo. So I made a demo and he liked it. And so he started sending me elements from like things that no one had, like dats of like individual stripes off of the records of his records from the multi-tracks or just like, you know, anything practice tapes of him playing by himself there was a totally private kind of stuff floppies from s1000 s1000 floppies from live concerts of his like I, I mean, he just sent me everything this big fedex box of just like stuff so i took all that and i spent a long time making a record which ended up being called uh, the vertical collection we put it out in 97 in france it was under it was basically two of us mm -hmm. um it was him it was him and me and that it was like the it's the most kind of craziness of just ultra processing. So that kind of whole thing kept up. And by the time I got out here, when I started connecting with Charlie Clouser, who I knew from New York, but we'd sort of lost touch. And and actually, it's a funny story. He, you know, he called me at random in the 90s in New York to, to did I want to come down and work on Quake, you know, with the Nine Inch Nails and all that stuff. And I was kind of in the middle of that bass project thing. And I was like, no, I, I, I don't want to go down to that. I don't want to get sucked into that universe, but thanks, let's stay in touch. So we did. And because we had a bunch of friends in common where it was real close from, from the New York 80s era. So I came out here in 02 and turns out I moved here into the canyon. He lived half a mile up the road. And one day he phoned up and said, look, I'm doing this show. Do you want to do you want to do stuff? So I was playing bass and then there was doing textural stuff. And then um, it just seemed that, the you know, when the, the, the movie came along, the first Saw movie and he wanted some he didn't know what you said. Give me some really bizarro, insane stuff. So I had all, I'd been doing all these crazy process bass samples and guitar processing things. Again, no synthesizers. It's all just sampling and ma manipulation and just extreme multi-generations of processing and, and you know, reworking stuff. 
and that just worked out great. So I worked on every one of those films of his. Every time there'd be like, every year there'd be like a Saw movie and I'd like crank up the whole machine again and give him a whole new batch of stuff. And that, it just turns out that like everything that I've pretty much ever done for him and for another composer, a dear friend of mine, Anton Sanko, who's here in town, who does, does uh, Siren and he did Big Love and a bunch, you know, uh, Annabelle and a bunch of other stuff, any, any of the horror movies, it's always like this, I, you know, I have synthesizer plugins and, and I don't, I sold all the hardware except the Oscar and it just broken in the other room. But uh, I, you know, I, I always just reach for the textural, textural stuff that I make using loop reverse on the iPad or in the old days it was a repeater, but it's all done with basses and guitars. And I just have this massive library of that. And I keep adding to it. And it's crazy. You can get, especially with the modular stuff now, you can get so much mileage out of like, you know, a, a, a few hundred samples that you've made over 15 years or whatever it is like you know long textual things I can that's what, sort of always what I go for that so you know anything even like I did a few things with Cliff Martinez at one point um uh that just here and there a couple of movie projects and it's always that's what I would reach for and it always just seems to work out because it ends up being like this thing that has its own characteristic which has imperfection and you know that it's it's got this kind of weird, there's a there's a person in there somewhere, you know, because it's slightly out of tune or there's just strange pitch inflections and all this, even though it's ultra processed. And that seems to kind of work out in, in a weird, weirdly kind of wide array of, of situations. So that's kind of my, still my methodology for everything. It's like the, the only way I can seem to do anything that I like is if I narrow it down to no, just sampling, just processing it, nothing else. Otherwise I just, it just gets too unfocused, if you know what I mean, you know? Yeah. What well, what was like um I'm I'm really curious about one thing like would you guys like working on films and games Richard I know you worked on some films and games by the way I've been playing Doom all quarantine man that shit is so fucking fun I I'm just <laughs> killing demons all day after this I'm gonna kill some demons you you got it just on that exact subject just random coincidence I've been we're all watching too much YouTube and TV and whatever else because we got all this time. Check out the John Romero talks on YouTube about the development of Doom. And there's there's so many of them and it's fascinating to see what those guys went through. They developed that whole game on the next platform and just the whole drama of how it started, how they got there and how what it took to get them. It's, anyway, check it out. It's really fascinating. I'll definitely check that out. But um, so would you guys working on film and games? I, I know like you worked on trailers too. How, how does it feel I guess what was the first moment that you can really vividly remember seeing a movie or a game or a trailer and being in a movie theater or sitting in front of your TV being like, man, that was my shit. I wrote that. <laughs> Do you guys have like a special moment that you want to share with something along those lines? For anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it might be a thing where like in film, and it's been my experience and I've seen it with a friend of mine, one of my main collaborators works with Tom Newman, Thomas Newman, the film composer. He does tons of textural elements for him since, since the eighties. He's been on every single movie, mm -hmm. but it's, you can't necessarily listen to the scores and point to one thing and say, that's him. Even though he's key, it, it just ends up being mixed into the overall textural profile of what's happening at, at any given time. So I've had the same experience, like rarely does anything I've done, like let's say with Charlie on the Saw movies, once in a great while, I hope oh, there's that sound because it's in the clear, but a lot of times things are, are mixed in or they're part of a, an atmosphere that's happening. I'm, I would imagine everybody else has kind of had that same situation. Exactly. Peter, are you, uh, Peter, are you talking about that, uh, the Thomas Newman collaborator, that guitar player? Um, not, there's, there, there's two guys, George Deering, that's not, not George Deering, I'm talking no. about Rick. Rick Cox is the guy. Rick, Rick, Rick Cox, that's right. Yeah. This is another coincidence. I just like down a YouTube hole stumbled. Mm. This is a random something to watch recommendation. Rick Cox has some really good YouTube videos about how he sort of almost does like prepared guitar yeah. sound stuff. Yeah, he's using like a, mar a maraca on the guitar so strings. cool. And, I highly yeah. recommend searching that. He makes yeah. some really, really great sounds. Anyway. Yeah, Rick is, is a dear, dear friend. I mean, we talk every multiple times a day. I mean, he was with John Hassel. For, we, we, we toured with John and recorded with him over many years and I worked on a couple of Rick's own records on Cold Blue um, and he wow, is just really cool. he, is, he is one of the most fascinating musicians I totally agree if you don't know who he is check him out he's on every Thomas Newman film since Desperately Seeking Susan and he's just he's extraordinary there's no one that thinks about harmony like him there's no one that thinks about texture and just just this his, his sense of harmony is incredible and sophisticated like nothing I've ever seen 
And he's just uh, an amazing, unique character. It's definitely worth checking out. Did you guys uh, work with, um, or on the Saw movies, do you, do you, are you familiar with Chaz Smith? Oh yeah, Chaz is a, actually, he's part of the same crew with, yeah. with Tom Newman, because they had a, uh, Rick and Tom and a guy called George Budd um, have a, had an experimental project where they did a record. The project was called Tokyo 77, which is also worth checking out. It's awesome. Chaz is a, another dear friend, a monster, incredible, incredible. guy that, that builds yeah. these titanium with, he's like a precision welder and yep. an amazing lap steel guitar, a pedal steel guitar player and yep. you know, new music composer. He's just this like insane polymath and with incredible skills. And he just, there's no, he's a total original. There's no one like this guy. He's on a lot of Hansa stuff, these massive sounds. And so I introduced him, his stuff to Charlie when the saw thing happened. And so the, there's a couple of Chaz's instruments that basically Chaz would license the use of the samples to Charlie, who was thrilled about it, made them a huge part of the sound of that of those movies. And then every time the year would go by, there'd be another one. He'd just pay him another license fee. And Chaz, so Chaz was happy, pretty happy with me for that because I just kind of got him a, a regular annual uh, annual gig. But he's he's an incredible and a total sweetheart too. But just yeah, I love him. He's great. I remember he when I was last at his studio, he told me that they were using some of his instruments in the in the Saw film. Some of it, some of his giant, you know, water. Uh, um, yeah, there are things with metal rods and all that. Yeah, stuff. yeah, he's got like water phones, but custom water phones. Yeah, they're not really water phones at all. They're they're totally his own designs. I mean, his own design. Yeah, he's yeah. just an There's incredible. A thing called, this thing called the th the thing called the Kalosta which is a sheet of this like aerospace titanium that's suspended in this insane frame and he'll tap it and bow it. And it's just like, yeah. let's check, look for Chaz Smith because it might get confusing if, you don't, if you're not familiar with him because you might see him playing these lap steel and pedal steel guitars. Just a quick it's, side note about that. Incredible. This is a guy who would go out to a industrial metal supply place, buy a block of aerospace alloy that, you, that, the, that the public can't normally get, just a block of it. And then a precision machine, a five string pedals, lap steel bass guitar out of it. Like high precision, beautifully finished wow. from a block of alloy, of this exotic alloy. And he did, and it's actually blue. It's this blue alloy. He calls it junior blue. I was like, Chaz, how much money do I have to give you to make me? He was like, nope, not doing it. He, he won't do it. <laughs> but, but he's like, nope, never, sorry, don't stop asking. But he, he is just, his, the level of brilliance and technical precision and imagination and just, talent that this raw talent that this guy has on these different areas makes him he's a must he's a must to check out so yeah oh yeah his stuff out. yeah i think he wrote this album descent i remember wondering when i first heard that record i was like how in the world is it getting oh, yeah. this otherworldly like metal changing bending textures and stuff and then a friend of ours peter who also makes modular stuff he introduced me to Chaz. we played a we played a concert together at the uh Oh, what's that place? The Red Cat uh, yeah. in, uh, in Hollywood. Or not Hollywood, but just downtown Los Angeles. Downtown, yeah. And um, we got a chance to go to his studio for a couple nights and hang out with Jazz and just shoot the shit, you know? And, you know, me yeah. being, a, I was already a fan of his stuff. I just didn't know how he was making it. And he was telling me he was getting, sourcing a lot of his parts out of airplane, leftover yeah. broken airplane parts from yeah. Lockheed. And actually it's also leftover alloy from the manufacturer of airplanes. Also yep. worth mentioning, Chaz worked at Surge in 79, building Surges. He you know, still had his Surge modular yeah. and his He mixture. sold it, he sold it, but yeah, that was- Well, this was, yeah, way back. I don't yeah. know, probably yeah, 11, he's... 12 years ago when I was last there, but yeah, I was absolutely- yeah. He had these sheets, these, they were like thin titanium Titanium, sheets. yeah. And I remember, like, just like you, I, I went in there and I was playing those sheets and I was like, oh my God, these are absolutely incredible. The, yeah. the rumbling, resonating tones you could get out of them. I was like, you was like, I, ha I, I have to get one of these. I have to buy one of these yeah. somehow for my studio. And he, I mean, he was just mind blowing. Um, he took a, like a, I'll never forget this. We were standing there in the studio and he had a, uh, it was like a fence post, just something you'd buy at Home Depot, like a regular old metal rod fe fence post. And he had some other, I don't know what the other, um, it was almost like a, it wasn't a drumstick, it was some other metal rod that he had. 
And he was able to play like a chromatic full tuning on this like fence post. You know, he was able to find every single pitch. And me and my friend Josh were standing there going, what did you just do? And how did you, we're like holding it. We're like, this is like, he's like, yeah, you can get this yeah, anywhere, you know, but he just had an ear. He just knew how to get the sounds out of these objects. And just, he understood, yeah. you know, just things that were far beyond what we could even understand when it comes to like instrument design and working with different metal, oh, yeah. the way they resonate and what other metals and how other things would vibrate into each other. I mean, it's just a fascinating part. They really should do a documentary on jazz his, yeah. and all it's, of it. You're absolutely right. I mean, he, it's, it's important to note that he comes from that whole Harry Bertoia. Oh, I love Harry Bertoia is <laughs> another one of the gods when. <laughs> yeah, so that's one of, one of Chaz's heroes was, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe the originator of that whole thing. I, um, I would probably say, yeah, when I got an unfolding, that was, I got that album probably 15, 16 years ago. And it, he was teaching, he was a professor at Cranbrook University in Michigan, uh, working in the metals and the, uh, I wanna say it was like textile metals department or something where it's basically an art school, a fine arts mastering school where you can go in and work in any medium. And he was one of the teachers there. And um, he also did some furniture design, some other kind of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. But then he got into building these instruments. And the, uh, for those of you guys who know Harry Bertola's work, but he built these beautiful, uh, these rotted sculptures that you could play. You push them together and they're like, some of them are 30 feet high, 40 feet high. I did extensive recordings when I was at Cranbrook of these instruments and they're just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Yeah. Nothing else makes that sound. Nothing. I mean, I, and I could listen to those for hours. You know, I recorded, I probably have eight, six hours of recordings of, of two of those instruments they have in the Alumni Museum there. They were, mm. they allowed me to go in after hours and I was able to go in and record them. And really, really like, I, I think I brought a couple of Sennheisers and uh, I had a Neumann RSM-191 mic. I brought, I brought a whole bunch of stuff in there to get these captured and check the just the most pristine quality that I could. Cause I was like, I may not get this opportunity again. I got to jump in when I can, but he yeah. is, yeah, hyper, I mean, if you guys get a chance, you should check out some of his stuff. Like I remember hearing that album just being like, I don't even know how this was created. Yeah. This, There's books on him, but his music, I mean, it's it's just the beyond. most otherworldly, timeless. What's the name of that record? timeless. Well, the, just the guy's name is Harry Bertoia, B-E-R-T-O-I-A. Mm -hmm. but we, we, need, we need links to all of these obscure genies that we're talking oh, about. Yeah. It's been like at least three or four people who I know want and fully have the time to check out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you put up a, a blog post with this stuff. Yeah, yeah it's a good idea. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Jacob, yeah. can I ask you a question about some sound design stuff? Because I've been watching Blue Planet, Planet Earth 2, and I remember, I mean, I was at Remote Control as an intern three years ago and just asking you some random questions about the Buchla. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But what's your approach to, I mean, a lot of the stuff is, it seems like you're blending with the orchestra so well. And I've just been studying this music during the quarantine and you did an amazing job. So. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I really, um, I mean, this, this is, uh, when I got into the Buchla stuff, it was, it was really um, uh, all to do with, with uh, Alessandro Cortini who's uh, a good friend of, of Mr. Devine's, I think. Yeah, I talk and, to Alessandro almost every day. <laughs> yeah, and I just, right. there there was a, a like sonic state back in 2015 or something that showed his his setup. And I had also seen a couple of things of him playing on, on the music easel, the Buchla music easel. And I, it kind of, it just, well, for one thing, it, I'll, I'll say Alessandro Cortini, he, he can make anything sound, he's just a, a raw talent with, with a, an incredible ear. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm just a fan of him musically. But, but aside from that, I was not familiar at all with, with the Buchla stuff. I kind of seen it in a sound on sound in like 2013 or, or 10 or something. And, and I thought it looked beautiful. And then I remember Hans kind of, he had like a 12 module system. He's like, I can't use this. I don't, cause he's such a big West coast. 
or East Coast guy, excuse me. Uh, he's, he's such a big Moog guy. So in any event, I went out on a limb and bought a, a re-released version of the easel. And that was right around the time we got Planet Earth 2. And uh, the thing that I, I had kind of always thought, uh, I, I think maybe, you know, kind of a bit like-minded with, with Richard was like, the kind of normal vanilla synthesizer stuff didn't excite me. Like the, you know, the big poly synth kind of like eighties jump kind of, you know, the, it just, it, it didn't grab me in a way that, that like when I plugged in the easel and I just, I started sending it through like guitar amps and stuff. It just started acting like this, like a live animal <laughs> that, that like felt it felt like a human performance in the way that I felt like a lot of stuff wasn't. Um, and I, I think the reason that the, the stuff blends so well is literally because that instrument, it's like a, a game of chess when you're playing it. You, you get this thing that you don't expect and then you work with it and you work with it and you work with it. And um, and you arrive at some, it's got this built-in spring reverb that's like super boomy, that like this really low setting. It's just got this, like you record really quietly with it and then turn the volume way up after the fact. You kind of get these really, really organic sounding things that that sound like acoustic instruments. I, I remember making a patch and it sounded like an electric bass, like literally an electric bass. And, and I, I didn't, Think that was possible with synthesis until I I got that and then I went hog wild and bought a whole ton of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I have a quick question for you guys. So in 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 a way, ever like everyone in this chat is kind of like, you know, I guess in a in a decent position when it comes to the pandemic. Like our studios are at home. We can work from home. Or you know. We have toys to play with, arguably more time now to be creative and inspired, although it's totally understandable to not feel inspired during a pandemic, especially if you're dealing with things at home, too. But in how is this pandemic affecting like the sound design film composing industry in terms of like, you know, being able to do your job, I guess, and, and, and function correctly? Well, I mean, I, I, I can only speak for myself, but mm -hmm. I have absolutely no idea at this point how it will prove to have affected work. I mean, the, I mean, work, work, you know, work for hire work. It, it, it was, so, I mean, it was the flip of a switch one day. It was the, the beginning of pilot season um, for better and for worse. And the next day there was nothing, which for better and for worse, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I suspect we're all fortunate enough um, to be able to ride out the worst of this and then it will get interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm fortunate to, to be working right now, which is awesome. Uh, managing homeschooling my children and working is hard. Uh, it's been its own kind of curveball. Uh, I have two kids that are 10 and 11, two girls. Um, but I was talking with a, I, I, my space is like 0.2 miles from my house and I work at a post-production facility. Uh, we have a psych wall and I work with a, I, I share space with the director and a, and a DP. So like I'm able to come in here uh, because there's no one else here. It's its own kind of remote thing and I can just walk. Um, but I was talking to him and it's more or less like, while work is good now, all the work that I've kind of built in relationships for like maybe two years plus with filmmakers. Like I met a filmmaker last November, I flew out to London to go to a film festival. And then actually the only reason I did this film festival was to go to London to meet this filmmaker to kind of like get drinks with him and talk. We like hung out for like four or five hours and it was like really, really awesome. And I've developed this relationship with him for like maybe three or four years. Um, and he was supposed to be greenlit for this film and I was gonna score the music. And like that, boom, the film's just on hiatus. And I have like five or six other films that are like that, you know? So it's not so much like right now, it's more or less the, the long term. Like what is it gonna be like six months after the quarantine's over, you know, or like a year? Because a lot of developed projects 
are being pushed or not funded, you know? So yeah, it's kind of tricky, kind of long view. You know what I and mean? And also because, I mean, production just naturally involves large numbers of people, yeah. particularly actors really risking their health. You know, so yeah. like even, even, even if we sort of start, start opening up bit by bit, that's like hardcore. Yeah. You know, that's right. like stage five. That's that's way later, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. I, and and then just one other thing, because I said about you know half my time is still spent doing live stuff and touring. Like all my friends who are, I I, I feel really bad for all my friends who are a hundred percent in that world, because that yeah. is just uh, it's all a big question mark. Look, none of us know what the future holds, even short term, let alone long term, but. A, almost certainly there is like Craig was just saying this gradual opening up that's going to happen and as challenging as opening up like a film set would be that's still like a closed environment in some to some degree when I think about like just personally like the stuff I'm going to be most reluctant to do it's like standing in a crowded room with a dirt bag I don't know breathing on my neck you know what I mean like I don't know when concert like concerts are going to be the last thing that comes back i think oh. yeah um because it's purely and they're purely voluntary too obviously so yeah it's just you know it's just a, a question mark no one really knows and i think we all just sort of have to hope that therapy treatment vaccine etc just comes along as fast as it can thanks to an unprecedented uh, you know, glo uh, global pan uh, global um, coordination effort that's happening right now, but it is just a big question mark. Uh, John, I almost got into a fight with someone at a war on drug show. <laughs> the only <laughs> how can you? It's so chill. <laughs> I know we're pretty chill. That's, yeah. uh, it doesn't seem like our demographic. Well, okay, so Ray, you were this was a Vegas there, yeah. Hall, um, yeah. and I think before you guys. He was kind of an asshole, but before you guys, there was like a Eurorack set, which was awesome, dude. It was like yeah, that's sick. our buddy Chris Colte. He's phenomenal. Chris Colte, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then this guy, I just, I guess this guy just didn't get it, and he was just like, "Good." He was shouting like to the top, he's like, "Get off the stage, you are on drugs." And I was just like, "Man, chill." And then he did it over and over and over again to the point where like we were like, "Dude, you gotta, you gotta go." <laughs> but he yeah. was definitely, yeah. yeah. That's a shame. <laughs> Not representative. <laughs> no, totally not. It was a really good show. Yeah. Very chill. <laughs> um, yeah. And I guess the last kind of question I have is we're, we're talking a lot about like analog gear and a lot of what I, at least for me, with a little bit of a sort of still naive perspective and film composing, when I think about it, I think about like big orchestras and I think about, you know, kind of big sets, you know, Hans Zimmer style like that. Is there still a need for li recording live orchestras when you got things like Spitfire audio and you got like really good VIs? Is there such, do you still need that organic, you know, kind of sound? Yeah. Spitfire. Yeah. Depends on context. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> you got the budget for it. If you got the budget for it. And because I mean, the real, nothing sounds like the real thing. I mean, I, the first time I'd ever been around that, and this is not my universe at all, but the first time I'd ever seen that was as I uh, went to a few Tom Newman sessions of, over at Fox and just sort of being in the room when they're get, running a take in that in the, that gorgeous room with these amazing A-list players just sight reading this stuff and hearing that magnificent sound, there is no way to get that with well, the energy. virtual instruments yeah. or samples yeah. or anything. Forget it. It's bullshit. It's, it's air sats. It's fake. It's a simulation. If that's what the if that's what you need, then that's the only, the one and only way to get that sound. Unfortunately, it's slightly expensive, but holy hell, I, I was, it was a religious experience and I'm not religious, just, you know, to, to hear this, you know, downbeat and this, this gorgeous sound happens. And I'm just, I just stopped in my tracks. Like, this is, you could feel the air moving in that room just because of all that humanity making this beautiful thing. And it's just, it was, so I don't, I don't think that's going away anytime soon. It's just very much the, the top three percentile uh, of films can afford to do that. But oh my God, that sound is, I just, I reject was, simulations or emulations of anything. It's like, no, that's, that's the only way to get that. That's where, <laughs> that's where, I, that's where I had my, I, I came to the same conclusion on the Fox stage one day. 
Did it, you'd, you'd have to be dead not to have that reaction. Oh my God. I was like, <laughs> like, okay, okay. Cause you know, we, we do a pretty good job of, of tricking ourselves and fooling ourselves in our lovely sounding studios. Yeah. And shit does keep sounding better and better yeah. and better and better and better. And it is more and more useful. But then you walk into a live room. That's and the thing. You can sit there with back. Spitfire all day long with, you know, you know, multi-channel, you know, 192K, whatever. To go to the real thing. It's like, oh. It's <laughs> you know? And the other thing about, about the live, uh, you know, recording it live is, is, Every every sample thing, and and we've really come a long way in terms of textural exploration in the sampler and stuff lately. It, things are getting interesting and cool, but it's all kind of snapshots in in a way that that like if you have if you if you orchestration should be kind of like an analog filter. You know, it's not stepped. It's like this very fluid musical you know, well-considered part of the craft. And uh, and you just, you can't do it. You, you can try your damnedest with samples, but it's it, you, you can't say, okay, I want, you know, these two cellos to sit on this room for this cue, like in this space. And uh, I mean, there's there's just too, too much um, fluidity in a recording session to yield the result that you want. I would, I would add one thing to that, which is that, yes, if you're going for traditional instruments played in, in a normal way, I absolutely agree with you. All that chiaroscuro that you get from having two humans playing even the same thing in unison is unreproducible. No matter what programming, contact scripting somebody does, I don't care. Forget it. If, you have, if it's supposed to be played, play it by, with good players. But if you're going, if you're talking about sampling outside of that universe where you're trying to create otherness, I would say that it is absolutely possible to get really interesting places with long enough and detailed enough multi-channel samples handled properly. You can absolutely avoid that problem. Um, it just, because then you're really in a different space, but yes, for what you're saying, no question, get people to play it. Yeah. And I've, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, honestly, the, the, I think that's what's so exciting about living in this day and age is that we have access to the sampling kind of monster and all these synth things like we the the palette is is so wide in terms there's of no limitations exactly it's only about so, so guys i understand what you're saying when when i get my first gig when i was working with heavy acid working in the damage library it was become like pretty successful for all composers everybody's using this thing i was probably the only one guy who never ending using this and trailers or anything because I would be such as like anyone else. And I, I wasn't using this for years. And I record like so many drums, all the weird percussion, gas tanks, you name it, junkyard. And we do this thing and the guys did a beautiful job and say, no, it's never gonna sound the same because we're doing like there's so many, the round robins and the repeating and you move the stage, you sound like, okay, but it stay sounds like fake. And no matter how many times I play, it sounds the same when you play. So the only way I finally started using this library after because be drummer, when I just bring my really drum, like floor time or like the big LP, like big can drum. And I started just recording over live drums, you know what I mean? And even if you put like like some simple SM57 mic just to record these drums, when I add this on top of this thing, there was completely different feel because this guy spent a lot of money to producing all these big drums. But when I add my personal yeah. articulations and the different room sounds with this thing, you will never say it's damage. And I finally was able to start use this library again. And, and I know I, I'm not talking about like example, like a big, big orchestra, because I do the same thing when I'm using like Spitfire, the Hans Zimmer, the drums collection. It's a beautiful fat low end drums that assembles when you listen to them. And I would be not able to get this drums recording when I record at home. But when I'm gonna bring like my floor drums or like bass drum and just overdub this with this thing, I, it's changed completely different, you know? It doesn't sound like Hans, but have this low mm -hmm. end. And this has come to like using the orchestra. It's, it's great, but I, I really believe using samples, it just give you and the low, the low end and the big, beautiful sounds what people spend in studios and just adding even like few like violins players or cello on top of these things. It just bring the samples to like really live. Right. Yeah. yeah. Another yeah, thing is totally you tend agree. to write towards the samples too, because yeah, like you know, you're blending this in the mix, yeah. and you know, and 
it just made the sounds more original. So you even mix like the guitar sounds with something else, and it's just it's just changing different for me. This yeah. is how I'm approaching these things. Right. Yeah. I did a demo recently for a, for a show, and somehow the producers picked the three song had a real violin player on. I think there is just some energy there, and it also just the violin player, Jordy News, is amazing. Um, and if you can't afford a f orchestra, in most cases, just that one real element, like what Robert said, over. Right. Yeah, just the one thing put sometimes on top, you know, and you completely change the mood, you know. It might be a while before full orchestras are able to play together again. Hopefully yeah, sooner I, later. I mean, and, and, you know, like also, no, no, we're not all working like, with a huge budget sometimes. It depends, you know, when you're working, you have a million dollars budget, it's a different thing. Right. But you're working and this budget for like TV shows, something you're not going to have the budget or the big movie score, but they want to have the same sound. So sometimes you have to have like, three strings players or four of them, that's it, and make the sounds big. So it's become handy and you stay able to make it uh, as a, you know, sounds design these things and make it happen. And Wait, so, yeah. Done. And to piggyback on saying, like, I think Peter was saying, anything is possible now, right? And yeah. I find, I find it's, it, in to talk about what you're saying, Patrick, like if we're sort of confined to studios, if live orchestras aren't, happening, I find it, of course, it differs from project to project and what the needs of a project are, but it's much more satisfying for me to use samples instead of in this kind of like, you know, ersatz way, trying to make it a fake orchestra, essentially. I sort of trying to do something with the sound of the samples on their own. You know, I've, mm -hmm. uh, for example, like on this thing I was recently doing, like I had a score that had a lot of solo cello and I'd mocked up the solo cello and then use and, and then uh, of course brought in a real cellist and it was that exactly what everyone else is saying that sort of magic happened but i then wanted to do some like granular synthesis with some of the cello sounds and i just played with uh, the stuff i'd recorded with the cellist but just something about i mean probably because they were so meticulously recorded something about the cello samples was for what the sound i was looking for just ended up being a better source material you know, and that's sort of like when I when I'm playing with samples and when I'm thinking about how to use samples, I, it always ends up being much more satisfying musically to me if I'm trying to sort of re listen to and, and use the samples for what they are intrinsically rather than using them, you know, as to try to fool someone's ears into thinking they're a real instrument or something like that, yeah. if that makes sense. It's not it's like real thing. We yeah. first on playing human feel, you know. No matter how many rent wrappings you're gonna put, it's still gonna sound like a machine eventually because you're gonna repeat yourself. And this thing is, humans not perfect, you know? It's all yeah. gonna be off and, you know, especially if you're not using Quantizide anything after, you're gonna get the natural feel. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I actually got into um, using analog synths. Uh, the first synth I ever got was a synth that a friend loaned me. It was the Moog, uh, the Moog Rogue. So a little two oscillator piece of shit, little synth. Uh, and it was like super gritty and dirty. Uh, and I really just realized that like, there's something really unique about using analog synths and scores because while a lot of virtual instruments aren't, you can make them sound kind of real, but I'm actually physically touching this synth, right? And each synth kind of has its own sound and each uh, like one mode will sound different from another mode, right? So like incorporating a lot of these sounds with virtual instruments and having a couple players come in really can kind of make the film different like the score different in a way because it's like like other people were saying like i've gone into films like to go see a film in a theater back when we could do that uh and i'd be like oh i know what patch this guy's using because you know like it's like patch number 37 or this or that so like i always you know i'm against the grain and wanting to be unique and wanting to be original mm -hmm. and so like that's why like i that's why i love using analog sense in my scores you know because it's like so it's such a tactile thing you can kind of like touch you know so yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, I feel like, I feel, this is why I feel so honored to be with everyone in this chat is because everyone really is focused in that pursuit of excellence, you know, and a lot of people will be like, dude, just use this uh, VI uh, piano or use this VI uh, orchestra when you really what you got, because, you know, their, their excuse is like, dude, no one's even going to notice it. It's just going to be a little cue. Um, you can just use VI, whatever. But like, <laughs> 
Um, yeah, but you know, it's just like what Evan saying and Peter was saying, you know, like the, the creative of the uniqueness of the sounds, this what's make us who we are, where we're getting, because we all find the all unique way right. to blending the sounds with different ways, different instruments, something to make them unique, original. If we all gonna rely chess and the sample libraries, you will be sound just like anyone else. It's not gonna be nothing unique of you yeah. or like another student who just graduated high school who wanna make a beautiful demo and just get into business with no having personality, no uniqueness, you know? You yeah, have I to... mean, that's that's an important point. I mean, we live, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, you got a uniqueness, you know? The, the sheer volume of stuff that exists where you can be Joe Blow coming out of any film music program in any college USA or anywhere and not have the fa faintest idea what an analog synth voice is and just jockey presets and sample libraries and have a very successful career. I think given that, this is an unprecedented landscape given all mm -hmm. that. And I think it's more important than ever. I mean, cause you can always use the excuse, well, deadlines, time, et cetera. And to an extent, depending on what you're doing in your circumstance, sure. But if you're really trying to do something that's personal and unique, you well, you have to have a, you have to have an idea. I mean, you, this doesn't just happen because you want it to happen. You have to be driven on by a vision of a sound world that you want to create that has to come from inside. But assuming that, you have to pursue that and and ignore everything else and not can't just be about loading up Omnisphere or whatever it is. The, yeah. the VI du jour. It's got to be. I mean, I'm speaking from a fairly sort of idealistic viewpoint, but like I just I just can't do it other than this way, because I, I just don't, I don't come up with anything good. I can only kind of do good stuff if I do it this way forever. And this is kind of, it's for better or worse, it's how I do things, but I, it's worth the sweat. It's worth the years of figuring out your own personal methodology and shutting out everything else and searching for your, that voice is, you know, if you have it in you to do that, it is absolutely worth it more than how, how mm -hmm. you are with coming up with you know, how good you are at the project logical editor in Cubase. That's all great, but it's not gonna make you interesting. It's not gonna make you special or or evocative. It's, you know, I just, I really believe strongly it's all about chasing that inner thing and filtering out everything else and figuring out how to bring what, whatever that is internally that's special and unique to you and from a sound and musical context. And also we're talking, I mean, I'm talking just to be clear, about specifically musical sound design elements, not sound design, sound design elements, not like, you yeah. know, explosions and so on, but very specifically musical elements that become woven into a film score, a television score. It's, I just feel like figure out your own methodology, you know, just, you know, ignore everything else and figure, find that and refine it. And that's like, I just believe in that path as being like the, the as far as bearing fruit over the long term. I really, I just believe that's a worthwhile. So, you know, I should find out interesting thing because like, I only know how to play drums, and, but I have so many different instruments from keyboards, from guitar, basses, cello, everything. And I figured way teaching myself playing this instrument very unconventional way, like where no one has ever played. Like example, I can take a violin and instead of using bow, I'm going to use like a small fan going in the strings, creating very quick sounds or something. So you stay have the sounds of the violin or of cello, the guitar, but not playing the traditional way what guitar player will be played because I don't know how to play this instrument. I see on TV, but I never gonna play like this guy play. So I'm using different way, but long as I have the sound body of cello or cello or like dobro guitar or like, for example, I, I was playing banjo and I love banjo because banjo is based on the drum. It's a drum with a string. So I was taking like a rat sticks and I was playing all kinds of grooves hitting the drum with the hands, hitting the strings and playing with the slides. And it sounds like a banjo, but it's not like typical banjo player would be played, but you have this cool rhythmic groove of playing banjo. So that's just the one example of how I will be play and be just the original stuff. Yeah, like I do that with the with auto the harp. I do that with the auto harp all the time. Yeah, it's, playing, yeah, it's, it's like, like a big band, you know, then you can send to like all kinds of effects, plugins, whatever you want to do with this thing. But it's just the approach to playing instruments a different way, find a unique, I think it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And you know, so far work for me. And this is why people contact me for the gigs because I make the instrument sounds different. What stays sound like the instrument, but it's not played the conventional way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, on Robert's point, 
a piano sounds like a piano. It's an upright. It's a, a grand. It's a sine way. It's a Yamaha. It doesn't really matter. It's going to sound like a piano if you hit that C on the keyboard. But, but you don't you have do, to hit the piano key in the piano. The, the moment when you open, the you know, the color right. of the piano, there's so many different things when you can hit the piano and make different crazy sounds, you know. And you don't have to hit with the key with the hammer. You can use drumstick. You can use forks. So, so many other things. You can use you keyboard, use vibrators. You can, if you yeah. use vibrators, <laughs> yeah. actually, no, I use like electric razor, you know. <laughs> like I, I post the video when I just go in front of my piano and I just use my electric shaver and I just stick <laughs> to the things and I put the symbols. We did a we did a prepared like a John Cage prepared piano sample library that uh, I did for Sony. It was a long time ago for Sony Media. It was part of an older collection, one of the premium collections. We did this whole. Yeah, I used like a rake. I played the string bed of a piano with a metal rake. And then um, what else did we do? We used hematite magnets where we would like let them go on top of the string. So they create these like ricocheting, like metallic yeah. uh, sort of stuff like that. And then hammering nails into each string that so that you would create these left and right tensions that, you know, basically copying a lot of techniques that John Cage would implement. And then you know, interweaving the strings with tin foil. That's another really, I don't know if you mess around with tin, tin foil is incredible. When you wrap a, or a, a wrap tin foil around like harp strings or any sort of resonating string instrument, you'll get these almost like, it's like real time granular synthesis happening. Yeah, because it's so these, light and it's resonant. And, and you can make cookies afterwards with it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm super into playing. I, I love that. I love playing instruments the wrong way. I like playing them with robotic machines or, uh, you know, one instrument playing another instrument or using, you know, just whatever things you, you can think of to get the most interesting results. And, you know, sometimes some of the weirdest sound, or most interesting sounds you get is playing something wrong and, you know, and. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's great. I love that. We, you know, I've been doing that for years. I have a whole graveyard of all these broken symbols and um, we call it the music room. I've got like thousands of things I've gathered and collected over the world, different didgeridoos to different frame drums and, um, you know, Australia, China, S South Africa, I've, I've, everywhere I travel, I always buy I always try to come with like five or six things I've never seen before. I was like, I don't even know what this is, but it'll come in handy one day. <laughs> and you learn play the way how you want to play, you know? It's making exactly. Sense. Yeah, you're right. There's no, I always tell people there's no right or wrong way to approach it. You know, whatever emotionally gets the idea across to the people is, is what you should do, whether that's a $1 toy or a $6,000 multi-band compressor whatever it is that you need to use to get that emotional impact for that person needs to feel at the end of the day is what is the most important thing yeah, yeah like like, like I, I like to go like sandwiches and free time i go to home depot i make myself yeah, home depot is great yeah i, I make myself <laughs> yeah, like, for sound design like 40 dollars you know and, yeah same yeah. here it works great there's, by built, the way, there's one thing as far as talking about pianos interesting interesting treatments of pianos that just in case anyone isn't familiar with this, um, take it back to the first Weather Report album, so 1970, 71 actually, 70, 71, where I think it's the very first track, I think it's called Umbrellas, where again, pre-everything, so just tape, you know, and Zominal was holding down chords on the piano silently, and Wayne Shorter would play the arpeggio of the chord he was holding down, and then they'd start the tape after, the, after Wayne finished playing, so it was just a sustain of, of each chord. Mm -hmm. And it's a, such a beautiful sound. They just hit a chord sequence, you know, and it would, they, did, they did that method, and then they would just half, half inch edit them together. And that was the track. And it's so timeless and kind of otherworldly with no, not even, not even plate reverb, I don't think. It was just literally the piano and, you know, Zonal holding the chords without playing them, shorter arpeggiating the notes, and just like edit, edit, edit. And it's just this kind of, what a beautiful way to start especially for a band as important as Weather Report to kind of make this statement like, okay, everybody, here's this. And it just didn't, it sounds nothing like 1970, as you can, you can imagine. So if you're not familiar with it, definitely check it out. It's just one of those inspiring little, little moments, you know? Yeah. Um, guys, I have a disclaimer from Kevin Wallen on the comments saying that don't use the foil stuff to bake when you use it on nickel strings. Um, but or in the Kevin, microwave. Here's the thing. Oh yeah, definitely don't put foil in the microwave. 
But Kevin, here's the thing. Foil has two sides, baby. You just got to flip that and then put the cookies on the other one. And then you're good to go. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you put the cookies on the piano string, we're talking about like a whole other range of ghost notes. <laughs> you're blowing my mind right now. <laughs> It sounds sweet. That piano sounds really sweet. <laughs> it's a sweet sound. I actually, I actually want to say, Peter, um, I, it's, I'm actually a bass player too. I was an acoustic jazz, I was acoustic bassist, uh, professional jazz musician, and I injured my arm and I couldn't play anymore. So I got into writing film scoring music. Um, and actually I'm working on a documentary right now. And um, it's like, it's based off of um, a Buto, which is a Japanese, well, it's like a, so it's a dance film and it's got different little dances in the film. And one of them is based off of the Buto, which is like uh, Japanese culture after World War II. Uh, and it's like this very like raw, the dance is done naked. Uh, and it's just a very like really difficult piece to watch. Like it's jarring and not comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so I actually ended up using bass guitar and I just used my fingernail on the strings. And I got like maybe 15 different tracks of that and then I like played the like the with a pick behind the the neck to get mm -hmm. some like the upper uh, harmonic frequency. Above, up what above the nut? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I yeah. used an ebo, and then like I did all sorts of some stuff, and you know just kind of like blended it together to kind of create this really jarring sound that I couldn't create with an analog synth or something because mm -hmm. it's like a tech, different texture thing, you know. Yeah. So it's really cool to see like to hear of another well one there's another bass player on the chat. What's yeah. up? <laughs> that you know there are other people that are like you know there's just so many cool ways to create really cool sounds you know not using a synth or you know using a sound library you know just like finding some interesting thing yeah you know, it's not that difficult i mean like those kind of scrapes and stuff i mean like the very first batch of things i ever did for charlie for the for saw one was some things that i even this is 2002 or something i these were samples that i did eight years before that back in new york where i had you know i had a room uh ray i don't know if you remember i had that room up at sir briefly yeah um and uh upstairs and i would just i mean that was like you know I don't, the rig was a lot smaller and simpler then but like it was just you know scraping things on strings long 20 second echo oberheim echoplex loops of, of stuff with that were then processed after that and they just were these long evolving dinosauric weird like pre prehistoric things from another era, and that stuff. I mean, I just said, I said to Charlie, I don't think this might be okay, and he just kind of went through. He's like, oh yeah, you know, fuck yeah, forget about it, and it just ended up, you know, he's transposing it up and down, making EXS instruments out of it because I was giving him just like single weird, unique samples that were thirty seconds long in stereo, just with all this stuff going on, and he would, and he's a brilliant manipulator of, as well as a great synthesis, he's a brilliant manipulator of samples. And instruments and so you know he would do things with them that i wouldn't think of just i'd give him stuff that i thought was like here's a thing that makes a statement and he would take it and recontextualize it some way and that we that was kind of our relationship for years still is actually even in the latest the new saw thing with them um, it's the they're calling it a uh, spiral from the book of saw i think it's what it's called it's like uh, chris rock produced it and he's in it and sam jackson plays his father i think is what it is i've actually never seen the movie <laughs> um but it's you know i I, uh, it's the same thing. He'll give me, a, sometimes it'll start with an idea and like, here's a rough idea and I'll do the same thing we're talking about. These long evolving elements that are bass, bass, bass guitar that is. Sometimes guitar is usually not. Um, and then I'll just throw, I'll just start shoveling stuff over to him and say, you know, you, you might not use 10 of these, but the 11th one is probably gonna be the one. And that's kind of usually how it works. He'll, you know, there's one of my samples that was done on a $300 Mexican Strat in two minutes in 2004, which uh, unfortunately someone ripped off me and it ended up on South Park and all these weird things. But you know, that group of things, Charlie has used like those same three samples of mine in different ways every time on these different projects. I keep saying, oh, is that that same, you know, and it's always a slightly different way that he's handling it. But it's, it's all, if you, if you can get that magic into some little 20 seconds of material that just has something right away. You could endlessly find ways to manipulate it and repurpose it. It's totally so. The thing you're saying is like I, that's that's I live. I try to live there. You know, I totally relate to that. You know. Yeah. Um, guys. So I, I want to be mindful of your time, and we've been on for about an hour and forty. So I just want to kind of uh, thank everyone. This was such a unique experience, and really, really, it was 
such an honor to talk to you guys. No, like kind of like just diving deep onto how you guys learned your own unique fingerprints and how you implement that into your own sound design and film composing. It's really such an awesome opportunity to be able to kind of pick your guys' brain about it. And I have a million more questions, but I don't want to be mindful of your time. Um, so I, I'm just going to say someone's name and or people, you know, everyone's name and we can sign off. Tell people where they can find you and what you guys got coming up. Um, Matt. Yeah, so um, again, my name is Matthew Wong. You can find me at Matt W Music, M A T T W M U S I C on Instagram, or that's my web. Uh, you can also pose your talk, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your preferred listening medium is. Um, and nice. Uh, Peter. At Space Wars, S P A C E W A R S, uh, on Instagram. That's probably the best. Thing. I'm also on Facebook, but the IG is kind of when I usually just post when I think something kind of interesting is happening in the studio. So that's kind of, that might be kind of fun if you're into this kind of stuff. Awesome. Robert. Um, can you just find me on Instagram, Robert Duzik on Instagram or my YouTube channel, or just robertduzik.com, my website. It's all information over there. Right on. That's it. Evan? Uh, yeah, Evan Hodges, film composer, E-V-A-N-H-O-D-G-E-S, film, obviously composer. Uh, that's my Instagram and my Facebook. Um, and um, my website's just evanhodges.com. Yeah, so go check some stuff out. Right on. Jacob. Yeah, uh, jacobsheamusic.com and jacobsheamusic on Instagram. I think Instagram's amazing just for musicians, period. I just started sharing. following you yesterday. I think, I, well, it's... it's it, it's just a wealth of inspiring talent out there. Yeah. Um, and, and for some reason, it just it feels like a, a much more positive platform to be on <laughs> during these yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah, it is useful. Yeah. Craig. Um, all my socials are just at Craig Wedren. Oh, I'm muted, aren't I? <laughs> no, no, we can hear you. <laughs> No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> well, I yourself, Craig. <laughs> oh, now I think he's muted. Now, Craig, now, now we can't hear you. And now you're yeah. muted. Yeah. Yeah, you're. I thought that was a joke, but you're. Muted. <laughs> <laughs> a joke. Um, all of my socials good. are at Craig Wedren. That's pretty funny. And um, funny. every day during quarantine, I'm doing live improvised sort of ambient choral vocal looping meditation music at 5 p.m pst so um if you're into that sort of thing please join me it's on uh facebook and instagram and youtube it is pretty dope i've, I've definitely tuned in a few times it's really cool man <laughs> thank you um richard uh, mine's really easy. Just um, all my social media channels just are with tag with at Richard Divine, Twitter and Facebook fan page, and then um, Instagram as well. And then I do have an old site, divinesound.net, that I haven't updated in a while. But um, but yeah, I mostly live on the socials these days. Like I agree with uh, pretty much everyone else. I love Instagram, and um, I get a lot of inspiration from other people there that are doing cool stuff and. Um, I feel it's a fun platform because you don't get political rants and this and that. It's just art and photography, video and music. And, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a great place, I think. Um, but yeah, that's where you find me. I'm, I've just been using it, um, working on a new record right now. It's coming around about two hours worth of new music. And uh, it's pretty strange. I'd, I'd say a lot of the new experiments I'm now getting into live coding and stuff. For oh, all that dude that was so sick <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i just started diving into title cycles and this like this whole world of stuff that's happening in this the algo rave scene is just fascinating when it comes to musical like musical strategies for like new sequencing approaches is the best way i can describe what's going on i mean you can do like I, and i'm just scratching the surface but it's just fascinating what you can do with some of these environments like it would be impossible. You wouldn't just, you wouldn't be able to do it. It would be, it's like impossible music. Is that what I call it? Um, and uh, so I'm kind of getting into that. And it's my machine learning AI 
uh, you know, a generative sort of stuff. Like for these next chapters, I'm really kind of diving deep. Like this whole quarantine thing, I've been diving into these things I've wanted to look into a while, like maybe abusing these te newer technologies and things that are starting to come out and to come up with new sounds and working with a, a big company right now, it's going to dr drop a pretty big announcement pr pretty soon that revolves around machine learning with synthesizers. So um, I think it's a pretty exciting area that um, is going to be really, really cool for people that want to generate lots of possibilities really quickly using utilizing this technology, not only for music writing, but also for sound design and for uh, sound creation. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. And um, I can't wait to share some of the stuff that that's involved with that. It's completely alien, like, like where, where things are going are scary and alien work because I'm seeing a lot of this stuff now. Um, but yeah, it's pretty exciting. I'm, I'm pretty excited to share that stuff coming up. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I hope that Jaguar gave you a free car for making it sound like a spaceship. <laughs> oh yeah. Everyone always asks. Yeah, no, we, we just got a, we got a nice check. We didn't, we were, we, you know, we weren't, um, my, my wife was wanted a minivan, so. <laughs> Jaguar's like, we'll make you a minivan, yeah, Richard. Like, yeah, but you know, three-year-old is gonna puke all over the seats, and like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna ruin a car that nice right now. Our kids are too young, and I was like, yeah, you're probably right. We'll, we'll stick with the minivan. up to put it in the minivan. Um, and John, I I keep a pretty low profile online. Quarantine will perhaps uh, give me the time and impetus to actually get a website going. But I am on Instagram, John Natchez, J-O-N-N-A-T-C-H-E-Z. At Instagram, I also like, um, yeah, I usually start my, my music day with a little uh, improv of my own. And I think I'm going to start um, sort of sharing those in stories. We'll see. I'm nice. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a grandpa who's scared of the internet still. But um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's how you can find me and just various music of mine nice. sort of around the, in the internet and stuff. Yeah, and we're going to find that guy who tried to pick a fight with me at the War on Drug Show. And you know what, ass, you man. and me, we're going to find him we're, and yeah. we're going to give him a piece of our mind. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. You really inspire us uh, yeah. to do what we do at Eventide. And we really appreciate your time today. Thanks, thanks for having fun. Us. Thanks, everybody. It's good to see um, good to see all of our geeky faces in one place. Totally. <laughs> Let's stay in touch for sure. Stay well, everybody. Thank you. Okay, Bye, guys. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.